So nature is responsive, intelligent, is forever changing, morphing. And uh, there are a lot of nature in Inner Mongolia, and especially pine trees. When I was a little child growing up there, I used to pick up mushrooms uh, after rain. But along the way, I also pick up pine cones. And actually, when you pick them up, they are all closed after rain, or the scales are closed. But after some time, you left it on the balcony, all the pine cone scales will open up. And the magical part is if you now put it back in water, the scales will close up again. And to me, as a little kid, that was a miracle. It feels like these little living robots, but they didn't have battery, and they were powered by rain in that case. Um, and uh, actually, indeed, there are a lot of uh, such nature robots. Um, if you search harder, and some they respond as slow as pine cones, that means hours or days when you want to observe them open and close. But there are also um, some really fast morphing natural matter. They would shoot out like a bullet and transform uh, within a blink of eyes. And uh, uh, I got really interested in studying this. Uh, after I finished my PhD at MIT, I started a, a lab called Morphing Matter Lab at Carnegie Mellon University. Um, and together with curious minds in and outside of CMU, we look at those natural morphing matter. Uh, we are very fascinated by the fact that they are very smart, they look like robots, they behave like robots, but they don't need to consume any electricity and they don't need battery to power them and they optimize and respond for the sake of survival. And we try to learn from uh, how nature engineer those uh, smart matters, but also try to use it to design uh, engineered systems that are hopeful, hopefully helpful or at least playful for, for our human society. So for example, learn how mimosa leaves will respond to human touch. We designed a paper version of that. In this case, you can see as you're touching the leaf, the leaf will respond. We eventually made some paper toys for kids. They're very uh, cheaply made. And we sometimes <laughs> also try to directly harvest materials from nature. So for example, we would grow bacteria in a, ba a wet lab and turn them into nano actuators. So those bacteria will respond to the moisture changes in the, the environment, such as the sweat on your skin, expand, and when your skin dries out, they will, they they will shrink. So we made this biohybrid fabric, and you, you see the scales on the back of the fabric uh, and they will respond to the sweat, open up to help you to get rid of the excessive sweat when your body is, um, is hot. So you can wear it as a responsive and smart garment in that case. As uh, a lot of way of us thinking about how to learn from nature and how to harvest materials from nature, we are also experiencing these huge changes in nature. Um, and uh, we feel painful, we feel painful for them. And we were thinking, you know, um, as nature's friends, we would love to call ourselves, instead of just taking constantly from nature, either lessons or material, how can we give back to nature? Um, and uh, we think about uh, the way to giving back to nature is to rethink about the way we make, wear, grow, and eat with the idea of sustainable morphing matter. And uh, talk about the way we eat. So there are a lot of plastic waste generated by food packaging. Actually, that, that was one of the biggest costs for, for plastic waste. And also, in Italy only, there's about 0.7 to 1% of green gas emission is caused by just eating pasta. Um, and when we talk about saving the plastic packaging for food, we have to talk about the design of the, the food, especially the shape of the food. You think about the very popular macaroni pasta. There's an inner cavity which takes a lot of packaging space. There are about 67% of the packaging space in macaroni pasta is for packing air. Uh, and uh, imagine if you can actually produce macaroni pasta and pack them flat. Only when you cook them, they will transform into this little cylinder shape. You could actually save that 60%, 67% uh, of the, the, the packaging space. Um, and we actually made it happen. So here you see a sped up video to show we can cook flat pasta and transform, into, transfer, transform them into different shapes. It takes about uh, 10 minutes. It's basically uh, the length of the time you would take anyway for cooking real pasta, old pasta. Um, and we can also control the shapes of the, 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 the 3D pasta. Um,
and they are made of authentic semolina flour and water as well. So it's completely natural. We are not uh, changing any of the mouthfeel or the uh, raw materials as well. And uh, we can control to make a variety of different shapes. As you can tell, some really look like the conventional pasta shape after cooking, but some are very special. They are actually kind of hard to make with the conventional extrusion-based uh, method to produce pasta. Um, and uh, you can also now encode different information in your morphing food. In this case, you can hide a hidden love message uh, <laughs> on, your, on your dinner plate. Indeed. It, 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 <laughs> All of us experience uh, this phenomenon. So when you cook pasta, you realize, right, a as time goes, the pasta becomes softer and also fatter. So mainly that's because the starch embedded in the pasta keeps uh, uh, swelling. And this is really the, uh, the secret of the design. Um, but what we did uh, as an additional step is to introduce some surface grooves on the, on the pasta stripes. So the side with these grooves will swell more slowly than the side without those grooves. So as a result, a flat piece of pasta, when you cook it in water, it swell as well, itself fold into a 3D shape. Um, and we can run multi-physics simulation to uh, uh, predict also what groove geometry will result in what kind of 3D shape after you boil them in water. And uh, we also developed a robotic system to do automatic stamping to generate the right kind of grooves you want on the surface of a piece of pasta dough. Uh, we also brought this into a hiking trip. It's actually just over the suburb of Pittsburgh. We were able to cook our morphing pasta on site. You see uh, those flat pastas are packed in a little package. You dip it in water with just a portable gas cooker. You can uh, enjoy your morphing pasta in about five minutes. <laughs> and we certainly thought about this uh, morphing pasta being really helpful for hiking trips. But uh, how about the other uh, scenarios where you think the packaging space or the uh, packaging efforts are essential? Definitely for sustainability, but also maybe for disaster food delivery. Or think about the future space travel. We are on a three years mass journey. Um, the space on the spaceship is really precious. Uh, what about if you crave Earth-like food? Uh, because space living will be a lifestyle. So at this moment, maybe morphing pasta could be the answer. Um, talking back about our vision of rethink about the way we make, we cook, we grow, uh, we wanted to also talk a little bit about the way we make. So as you guys perhaps know, 3D printing is getting really popular, but it also generates a lot of plastic waste. Think about if you print this uh, plastic rose flower. If you use a conventional 3D printing method, this little rose flower, the size of my, um, my fist, will take about eight hours. And it takes about 80 grams of material, which is a lot. Uh, eight hours especially, that's a long time. However, think about if you can print a flat sheet that'll self-fold into this rose flower. It might save the printing time. Actually, that's true. Now you only need to take one hour, and also you only need to take 16 grams of material to print this flat disk. And we call this morphing matter approach of printing. Uh, printing. And we made it happen with just very accessible, low-cost desktop printer. So here you are pretty much just printing a few layers. And like I said, it takes much less time. Um, and you get this flat sheet. If you dip it in hot water, they self-fold into a uh, rose flower. You can pre-program. Um, and we can predict the shape um, um, with uh, computer simulations as well in this case. So we call this 4D printing. You think about it. There's a temporal dimensional changes and transformation after you finish printing and after you offload this from your printer. Uh, and uh, it's also an uh, interesting uh, scientific phenomenon behind the design. So when you get your printing filament, uh, so all the polymer chains are arranged in this random mode, it kind of like uh, randomly arranged spaghetti. But when you melt the filaments and extrude it on a printing platform, you are forcing the polymer chain to stay straight. Energy-wise, it's not the preferred states for the polymer. So uh, if you... Uh, after printing, so the polymer chains will stay straight. But after you um, place it in water, heat it up, so the polymer chain will try to shrink back to this random mode, and that will cause a contraction of the printed piece. 
So now, if you, pr if you de de deposit this shrinkable stripe on top of another layer that doesn't shrink, then it will bend. Uh, so this is what happened. You put a flat piece under heat, it will bend up. And you can actually control the bending angle if you control the width of this stripe. And then with that, you can start to compute different kinds of self-folding origami shapes. Uh, for example, you can print a flat piece, um, put it on top of a hot spring, it self-folds into a boat. And uh, this is one of my favorite. You can actually print a self-folding furniture. We all love flat uh, pack furniture <laughs> because it's environmental friendly and also it saves a lot of packaging and shipping space. However, when it's on site, it takes you a lot of effort to assemble them. What if a furniture can self-assemble once it's on site? Um, it's, it's good for both the environment, but also uh, y y the labor cost. And uh, if you don't want to self-fold the entire furniture, you can consider folding only the joints. So here, with just a little bit of hot air, mm, you could use your hair dryer, you could self-lock the joints, uh, and you don't need to use any knots and bolts. That means a single uniformed material, um, and you can easily recycle it. Plus, this, this little stool you are seeing here is actually made of even biodegradable thermoplastic that's derived from corn. So, so with that, um, there's a vision about uh, circular economy in terms of making. Think about that you use biodegradable or recyclable material to start with. And then you save a lot of printing time and also material costs as you're manufacturing them. And then you save your packaging and shipping costs on site you save your assembly effort. And then the, uh, the whole artifact is made of a single material, so you can also easily recycle them and go through another printing process. And this is really a vision about um, how to sustainably, sustainably make with morphing matter. And again, rethink about the way we grow, we wear, we make with the sustainable morphing matter. And when we talk about sustainable morphing matter, we're talking about materials that kind of behave like robots. They are intelligent beings, they're responsive, they're adaptive, and they are constantly morphing. However, they don't use battery, so they are taking the energy from the environment. So they can leverage the sun, the wind, the rain, the even the moisture fluctuation in the air. And there is no electricity in this equation, so no battery waste, no electronic waste. And uh, with that, I would really love to end my uh, talk with a little call to the designers, makers, and engineers out there. In addition to, or instead of just taking from nature, how about we also design to give back to nature? Thank you.